2016, a year to consolidate, strengthen what you have. Don't lose what you have. Don't let someone take away what is yours. Don't lose ground you have gained. Prepare to transition to the next level. What we do at the very beginning of the new year uh, is to bring what we call as the word of the Lord. It's, it's what we believe God speaking to us as a church, as a body of believers. And uh, so before the year ends, we take time to listen, say, God, what are you speaking to us as a church? What is the word that we should release to us as a community? Uh, that doesn't mean that this is the only thing God is speaking. Uh, that is, doesn't mean that this is the only thing that God will put in your life personally. Uh, but uh, our intent here is to say, God, is, what is that key thing that you want to bring to us as a church? What, are, what is that that you're telling us as a people? And so uh, as, as long as we can remember, we've been doing this every year, every new year. We transition in. We bring a word. And we encourage you to believe that word, to receive that word, and to you know, act on it, to put it into practice and, and see the blessing of God uh, come in uh, to our lives. So as we step in, as we've just stepped into 2016, uh, I want to release for us as a church, as a body, as, as, a, as people who are part of this community, uh, what I believe the Lord is speaking to us for 2016. Now, uh, the word that I want to release to us is, is not necessarily a word of promise, but it is a word of instruction. But every word of instruction ends in a promise. It ends in a blessing. If we do that, if we follow through on it. So the word that I want to release, I feel the Lord just speaking to us as a church for 2016. Is that 2016 is a year to consolidate. It's a year to consolidate. To strengthen what you have. So it's a word of instruction that God's speaking to us. It's a year to consolidate, strengthen what you have. And obviously when you do that, when you and I do that, when we do that as individuals, when we do that as a people, it's going to bring us into a blessing. It's going to bring us into a, a reward. And we'll talk about that as we uh, go into this sermon. But the passage I want to use here, I'll let you sit in a few minutes, so don't worry. <laughs> Psalm 84 verses 5 through 7, the Bible says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, meaning the valley of tears, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God. Our journey through life is like a pilgrimage. We are on a journey. We are headed towards our, our destination that we want to appear before God. And as we make this journey, God's intent is that we go from strength to strength. That means we are always in a stage of increasing from strength to strength. We may pass through the valley of Baca, meaning a valley that's really tough, that's the, the, the valley of tears. It's a place where there are bushes and thorns. But even as we pass through it, God's promise is you're going to make it a pleasant place. You're going to make it a spring. It's going to be covered with pools. And it's only going to see you go from strength to strength. But here's the key. In order for us to go from strength to strength, we need to consolidate. In order to go from strength to strength, we need to consolidate. To consolidate means to make something stronger. It also carries the idea of bringing a number of things together into a unifying whole, which is stronger than the individual components. So in 2016... Strengthen your hold on what you have. Raise up your defenses and secure what is yours. Solidify your standing. Make yourself firm and unshakable. And do this in every area of your life. 
your spiritual life, your personal life, your family, your marriage, your children, your professional life. Do this in every area. 2016, a year to consolidate. Strengthen what you have. We'll delve into this further. You can be seated, please. So as I just waited on the Lord saying, God, what is the word? What is it that you're speaking? He simply said, you've got to strengthen what you have. You've got to consolidate. Strengthen what you already have. The opposite of consolidating is to disperse, to scatter, to act randomly, to act in a very disconnected fashion, which only results in diminishing value, it decreases, it weakens. So if we do not consolidate, we actually end up in a weaker position than where we were or than where we need to be. Some of us, some of us have seen resurrected dreams in 2015. It's beginning to come together. It's not the time to get all excited and, you know, say, wow, let me just, you know, it's all happening for me. No, you've got to be careful. God started a work, but you need to consolidate it. Make sure you secure it. Make sure you make it stronger. Otherwise, the good work God started will just dissipate. It just decrease rather than increase. God's intent is for us to go from strength to strength. But in order to go to a higher level of strength, we must consolidate. Now, some of us sitting here may say, God, you know, I don't have a whole lot to consolidate. My life's pretty simple. I've just got this little, but this little. But consolidate whatever you have, even the little you have. Consolidate that. We we'll talk about how to do it and why we need to do it. So some of us may, may, not, may feel we don't have too much. We don't have a whole lot. And so you're wondering, saying, God, you know, what do I have in order to consolidate anyway? But understand that in God's kingdom, faithfulness in little things is what positions you for increase. If you will consolidate even the little you have, even what God's put in your hand, the little that you have, if you will consolidate it, it will position you for increase. So don't, do not despise the day of small things. Do not despise the little you have. Do not despise the small things you may be doing, the small things that may be taking place. Do not despise it, but consolidate it. Because in God's kingdom, when, you're good, when you are a steward of the little you have, with whatever God's given you, whatever progress you've made, whatever ground you've covered, whatever strength you have received, if you will consolidate that, you're positioning yourself for increase. So the promise is greater strength. The promise is increase. The promise is the next level. But in order to get there, you need to consolidate what God's given you. So why do we consolidate? And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, and we need to do this in every area of our lives, in every area, professionally, personally, family, spiritually, in every area. And we'll talk about us as a church as well. But why consolidate? So that you don't lose what you have. If you don't consolidate, you risk losing even what you have. So why consolidate? Because you don't, you don't want to lose what you have. You know, when the farmer works hard on the fields... He works hard. The fields produce. But what does he do with the harvest? He doesn't say, wow, we've got harvest. Look at it all. What does he do? He gathers it into his barn. He's consolidating the harvest. Got to be wise like the farmer. 
you've worked hard or you've done whatever you can and God's brought you where you are. He's given you a certain amount of fruit. Whether your field is an acre or whether your field is a small patch, it doesn't matter. Be faithful with that harvest your field's producing right now. Consolidate that. And even in spiritual things and the things that we've been taught spiritually, we have to consolidate. Hebrews 2 verse 1 says, We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now sometimes we hear it and it's okay, I've heard it before, I don't need to hear it again. But God says, give the more earnest heed to the things you have heard. Even the things you have heard, give them double attention, lest you drift away. And that is the very things that you heard, which are very foundational. If you don't pay more attention to it, Tends to leak out. And what you thought you had, soon you'll find out it's been dissipated. It's gone. Got to consolidate even in spiritual things, the things that you have heard. Why do we consolidate? So that we don't let someone take away what is yours. Don't let someone take away what is yours. God's entrusted it to you. He's made you a steward of something that he's put in your hand. You don't want it to slip out. You don't want it to be taken away. When I say someone else, I don't mean some other person necessarily. The enemy is waiting to rob what God's put in your hands. Whether it's a gift, whether it's a talent, whether it's an opportunity, whether it is uh, an experience, whether it's a learning, whether it's a revelation, whatever, God's put that in your hands. If you don't consolidate it, you will lose it. And one of the reasons is because the enemy won't, it comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to take away what's ours. He comes to take away the word that was shown in our hearts. Even the word that you hear, you've got to be a good steward of it. Because the enemy wants to take away the word. Even the word. The word that we hear. Sometimes it's the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts for other things that rob us of the power of the word. So God entrusts us with the word, but we're not careful in the word we've received. And we let other things come in, they choke the word. Why should we consolidate number three? So you don't lose ground you have gained. You don't want to keep covering the same ground over and over again. What's the point? But if you consolidate, you will make sure that when I've passed fifth grade, I don't need to repeat my fifth grade or whatever. You don't have to cover the same ground again when you consolidate. So you don't lose what, what you've gained. In 1 Kings chapter 20, and I'll just narrate this story for us here. There's an interesting story of King Ahab, who was the king of Israel. And uh, King Benadad of Syria, who attacked, came against the king of Israel. In the early part of the chapter, 1 Kings, the 20th chapter, King Benadad comes of Syria, comes against Israel, King Ahab of Israel. And he threatens him, he speaks very rudely to him, very boastfully against King Ahab. But a prophet comes and says to the king, King, God's going to give you victory. Just go into battle. So King Ahab goes out into battle and he gains victory. But then the prophet comes back to the king and this is what he says. In verse 21, uh, it says that the king of Israel went out and attacked the horses and chariots and killed the Syrians with a great slaughter. Verse 22, and the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Go strengthen yourself, take note, and see what you should do. For in the spring of the year, the king of Syria will come up against you. So what the prophet comes and tells him is a very similar word to what we're hearing now. He says, you've got victory, but go back and strengthen yourself. Take a note of what you need to do to consolidate this victory because the king of Syria is going to come back in the spring of next year. It's coming back, but you need to consolidate. Get ready for that. You've gained a victory now, but you've got to get ready for another battle. It's coming up. 
Get ready. Strengthen yourself. Strengthen yourself. Strengthen yourself. Consolidate whatever you've learned from this victory. Put it all together. Get ready. Something's coming up. So King Ahab did that. And in the spring of the next year when King Benadad of Syria came against him a second time, once again, God was with them. He gave them victory. But King Ahab let flattery get the better of him. So when he captured the king, King Benadad and his soldiers, they flattered him. They said, oh, we heard that you're a very merciful king. They just flattered him. And he was so thinking, he said, okay, yeah, so I'll let you go. So he actually, God had granted him the victory. But he actually let go of what God had put in his hands. Why? Flattery. The nice things people said about him. The prophet comes to him and says, verse 42, 1 Kings. Thus says the Lord, because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people, meaning you're going to suffer defeat at this very thing, where God intended you to have a great victory. It's now going to come back. It's going to cause you defeat. And sure enough, three years later, King Ahab was killed by the very Syrian army that he let go. He didn't consolidate the victory God was granting. Yeah. He lost ground that he had gained. And in this particular case, flattery did it. Why should we consolidate? So that you're ready to transition to the next level. If we want to go to the next level, to a greater level of strength, to increase, we must consolidate. When we say consolidate, I'm not talking about inactivity. I'm not talking about doing nothing. Consolidation is really preparation for growth and expansion. When you're busy consolidating, you're saying, I'm getting ready for the next level. So consolidate everything you receive at each level. The revelation, the anointing, the experience, the impartation. Whatever you get at, at, at every level, consolidate it so that you can use it as a stepping stone into the next level. Are you with me so far? Whatever God's imparted into your life at this season, at this point where you are, consolidate the learning, the experience, everything. Put it together. Because you're preparing yourself to go to the next level in every area of your life. Whether it's professional or just every area, consolidate. So how do we do this? Just a few pointers here. How do we consolidate? We must learn to reflect on our victories. So many times we celebrate in our victories. We uh, we. You know, we thank God, we do all of that, and that's, that's good. But you also got to learn to reflect, think through. What did I really learn through this victory? More than the victory is the lesson that you learn through it. That's more important than the victory itself. To reflect on your victories. King David is a great example. We know his story in 1 Samuel 17. He killed the lion and the bear. Now he didn't go around all over town saying, lion and bear killer. Any problem, come to me. No. He consolidated that in, 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 inside him. And you know that he's consolidated that. Because when he faced Goliath, what did he say? The God who killed me, helped me kill the lion and the bear is going to help me kill Goliath. You know, he had, he had consolidated and he, he wasn't using it as a, 
as a badge, as a something cheap to get fame and name. He was not using it. That victory was in the past, but the lessons of that victory was burning in his heart. He was ready for his next battle. Don't live on a past victory. Live in the lessons of that. Amen? Leave those victories behind. It's done. It's over. The lions and the bears were killed back then. It's over. Don't live in that. But more importantly, live in the lessons. What was it? How did I have faith? How did I get the courage to face the lion? How did I have the courage to go after the bear? What happened in that moment? How did God speak to me? How did God let me know that I needed to go after that lion? And I needed to go after the bear. What was it? What did God do in my life? That's valuable. That lesson is what's going to prepare you to take on Goliath. Amen? So reflect on your victories. Even the small ground you've gained in your life, reflect on it. One good way to reflect on your victories is go back, sit down quietly, write down. What did I learn? What did I learn in this experience? Sometimes I go and listen to my own sermons. So you think I only preach to you. No. I actually preach to myself. I've been doing that, I don't know, from the time I was a teenager. I'll go back and listen to my own sermons. My question is, what could I have done better? How did I communicate? It's, I'm learning by listening to my own sermons. Why? Not only do I want to learn the truth, I want to learn how to communicate better, how to improve what I'm doing. So I go and listen. And I take notes. I make note of what I can do better. So when I preach the same sermon again, which I do all the time. <laughs> now, somebody said, you're to preach a sermon a hundred times till you get it right. <laughs> so the next time I preach it, at least I know what to improve. What are the mistakes I made the last time that I don't do it again? And how can I communicate that same truth? Truth never changes. So we keep speaking the same thing. Thank God we speak the same thing. But each time we do it, do it better. So I'm consolidating. I'm learning by listening to my own sermons. So everything, every experience, you go reflect on it. What can I learn, God? What can I do better? Because that's what's going to, that's consolidation. That's what's going to prepare you to go to the next level. Every battle you win is only a preparation for greater conquests ahead. How do we consolidate? Learn from your struggles. So even when you go through challenges, even when you make mistakes, even when you do things wrong, and even if you do it two times, three times, you're repeating the same mistake, hey, Go back and learn. Learn through your struggles. What did I do wrong? How could I have done it better? What was my mistake? Learn from your struggles. First Peter 5 and verse 10, May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. After you've gone through some stuff, after you've gone through some challenges, what's going to happen? You're going to come out perfect. You're going to come out stronger. You're going to come out established. Solidified. That's God's design. That's God's intent. So even if you're going through a struggle, say, God, what can I learn? Some of my sermons have come out of my own struggle. Things I've gone through. I say, God, what are you trying to teach me? What am I learning? What can I learn? What is in your word that I need to apply as I'm going through this struggle? And boom, things open up in the word. And I begin to apply it. And then, having learned it, through a struggle in my own life, I can come now, I can now come and 
share it, communicate it. So that struggle is not wasted. It's not like, oh, pity me, I'm going through a struggle. No, that struggle is an experience to learn something, to go back to the word. What is in the word that I need to apply here? It opens up revelation. So learn through your struggles. Consolidate even that. Number three, how do we consolidate? Refuse to tolerate what weakens you. If I want to consolidate, one of the things I need to do is to say no to the things that weaken me as a person, that weaken us. Sometimes fear and intimidation weakens us. Well, we got to get rid of it. Fear and intimidation can keep us at and lock us down into one level. Well, while God is saying, I want you to step on into the next level. I want you to move on. I want you to step in to your destiny. But we fear and intimidation locks us down. A great example that all of us are familiar with are the people of Israel. When God brought them out of Egypt and he said, look, I'm taking you into a land that, that's, that's for you. It took them just a year, a month, and five days to come to Mount Horeb and then 11 days uh, to get to a place called Kadesh, which is on the east bank of the River Jordan. So essentially, their entire journey should have lasted only a year, a month, and 16 days. And then they should be, have been ready to cross the Jordan from the east side and get on into the land of Canaan. That was it. But when they reached Kadesh, which was on the east bank of the river Jordan, they got scared. You know the story. They sent the 12 spies and 10 of them came back with a scary report. And so instead of crossing over the river Jordan, they spent the next 39 years or 38 years, circling around that mountain range, going round and round the same mountain. So the scenery kept changing, but they were locked into one place. What kept them out? Fear, intimidation. And sometimes for us, if we want to step into the next level, we need to get rid of the things that, that weaken us. If it's fear, if it's intimidation, get rid of it. The enemy will try to intimidate us. Nehemiah, as he was on his assignment rebuilding the walls of, of, of Jerusalem, Nehemiah 6 and verse 9, he recognized that the enemy was only trying to make him, him afraid. He recognized this is what the enemy is up to. Their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. And he said, God, you strengthen me. I'm going to finish this work. So don't let fear weaken you. Sometimes it could be sin. It could be compromise. It weakens us. Job said in Job 17 verse 9, the righteous will hold to his way and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. So you maintain your integrity. You maintain purity. It's going to make you stronger and stronger. But the converse is true. That sin, compromise could weaken us. And there could be other things in our lives. You say, what's, what's, what's keeping me down here? What's holding me at this level and not getting me, or not releasing me, not permitting me to move to the next level? What's it that's holding me down? Is it fear? Is it sin? Is it friends? Is it the wrong company? Is it the wrong things you're listening to? Habits? Wasting time, wasting resources, whatever it is. You examine your life. What's holding me down? What's putting a ceiling on my life? What's keeping me here? Get rid of those things. How do we consolidate? Number four, 
do away with what's unnecessary. Sometimes it may not, it may not necessarily be sinful things. It could just be all extra things. Good extra things that hold us down. Too busy with a lot of things that are really not necessary. Too busy with things that are really not helping you move to the next level. They may be good things, but they may not necessarily things that are helping you move up. Get rid of those unnecessary things. In John 15 verse 2, Jesus said, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it can bear more fruit. In order to bear more fruit, you go through pruning. What's pruning? Cut off the unnecessary things. How do we consolidate? Last one. Wait on the Lord for strength and wisdom. You wait on Him. He will strengthen your heart. You say, God, give me strength. Give me wisdom. I want to consolidate everything you put in my life so that I can move to the next level. Speak wisdom into my heart. Give me the strength I need to move to the next level. Help me consolidate. Wait on the Lord. Spend that time waiting on the Lord. So, 2016, are you guys awake? Okay. To wrap up this part of the message. 2016, what are we going to do? Consolidate. And what does it mean? Strengthen what you have. Strengthen your hold on what you have. Raise up your defenses, secure what is yours. Solidify your standing, making yourself firm and unshakable. Why do you need to consolidate so you don't lose what you have? Don't let someone take away what is yours. Don't lose ground you've gained. Get ready to transition to the next level. So there's a promise. There's a blessing. If you and I consolidate, we will be able to transition to the next level. Level, we'll be able to go to the higher realm. We'll be able to move into the next level in every area. Just to recap here, how do you do it? Reflect on your victories. Learn from your struggles. Refuse to tolerate what weakens you. Do away even with what's unnecessary. They may be good things, but they're not necessary. Get rid of it. Wait on the Lord for strength and wisdom. Before I close here this morning, I just want to talk a little bit about us as a church. So this message, each one of us need to apply it personally. Right? You go back home, and hopefully you're awake tonight. You apply. You say, what can I do to consolidate? Okay, so this is the word. I need to strengthen what I have. How do I do it? You wait on the Lord. You write down things that you're going to consolidate. How are you going to do it? You ask the Lord. What are things you're going to work on to strengthen what you have so that you don't lose ground you've gained and you can prepare for the next level. You go back home. You work on it. Okay? For you personally, in every area of your life, consolidate. How can I do this? But I want to speak for a few moments about us as a church, as a congregation before we close. As a church, we must consolidate in 2016. We began as a church in 2001, February 18, 2001. So coming February, February 2016, we'll be completing 15 years. And these first 15 years, we really focused on equipping God's people. So when people are coming and asking, you know, what kind of a church are you? Well, we are a church that believes in equipping. That's our focus. We equip people. We, we, we do what the Bible tells us to do in Ephesians 4. The reason he's given us apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. And that's what we are about. We're here to equip people. So everything we've done these 15 years has been towards equipping believers to grow strong in the Word, to grow in the things of the Spirit, to open up that whole realm, the realm of the Word and the realm of the Spirit. That's our focus. But this year, 2016, as we complete 15 years, we're also going to transition. We're going to transition from being just an equipping church to being a pioneering church. 
Everybody say pioneering. So we are transitioning. We're going from being an equipping church to being a pioneering church. So when somebody comes and asks, you know, what kind of a church are you? We're a pioneering church. So what do you mean? I'll explain. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to stop equipping because you cannot pioneer if you don't equip. So, of course, we're going to continue equipping the people of God. But we are thrust, our focus, our DNA, our, our, the nature of what we do is going to be pioneering. Now, to some extent, we've already been doing these things. If you look at what we've been doing 15 years, we've, we've been pioneering already in some, some ways, but it's going to become more and more focused and more intentional. Now, if you want to draw an analogy of what we're talking about, if you think about a, a person with a bow and an arrow, you've got an arrow locked in the bow, you've got it, you know, you've got your bow uh, pulled out and your you know, arrow is ready to be released, that's equipping. Right? You, 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 you've, you've done that. You've equipped people. You've, you've, you've imparted strength. You've positioned them. you put things in their life. You're ready. But it's still not making something happen. And you release the bow. Now the bow is pioneering. It's penetrating into the realm in which it has been released. And it's going to go find its target. So equipping is in some way getting all of us ready on that bow, ready to be released. But pioneering is releasing people, saying go into that realm that God wants you to go into, whatever realm that might be, and find your target. So each one of us, we've been equipped to pioneer and we'll continue to equip God's people to pioneer. They say, what do you mean pioneer? It means to do things that have not been done before. It means to go where no one has gone before. It means to step into uncharted territory and break new ground. It means to do, do things that are new and innovative. It means to break past barriers and limitations. You're a pioneer. Are you excited? I think it's exciting to be a pioneer. To do things that have never been done before. To be first in time to step into something, to do something that's, that's totally different. So we, we pioneer understanding and application of truth and revelation in our generation. So spiritually, we pioneer the truth is eternal. Truth itself is not new. But it takes pioneering people to take truth that's always there, to understand it and then begin to apply it in our life, in our day, in our time, in our situation. In business terms, we call them early adopters. They, they adopt that truth early on. They say, okay, let's do it. Are you with me so far? So there is truth in the word. That's not, we're not writing the word. It's already there. But we take it and we are early in adopting that truth to us. Our lives. For instance, one of the things we said very early on, we said, Every believer is a minister. That means you are as much a minister of God as I am. No difference. Every believer is a minister. You didn't hear too many churches saying that. Most churches would say, you're a church attender, I am the pastor. You listen to me. But no, we said every believer is a minister. So it was new for people to hear that. What do you mean every believer is a minister? You are a minister of God. You're called to do the work of the ministry. 
And our, go- our goal is to equip you to, for you to do the ministry. For you to heal the sick and cast out devils and raise the dead. For you to preach and teach the word of God. Because every believer is a minister. So you've got to pioneer in adopting the truth. Now this is not new truth. It's already there in Ephesians 4.11. This is not even writing something new. It's already there. But to adopt that truth in everyday life, you're a pioneer. Do it first. Show that God's people, everyone in the house of God is a minister of God. But we also pioneer in, in the expansion of kingdom into new territories. Leading from the front into new frontiers. So you, you say, let's go do something. I remember, I forget which year this was. But maybe it was 2003 or four. I don't know which year. Or four, I forget which year. But we used to have youth services in coffee day. Now tell me how many churches were meeting in coffee day for youth service. I'm not boasting, but I'm saying, look, stepping into new territory, do things differently. Where did our youth ministry begin? Began in coffee day. That's where we started. Until we outgrew the biggest coffee day that was in Bangalore at that time, which was on Cunningham Road. We used to pack that. Uh, sometimes 80 people, sometimes 100 people in a coffee day. That's where our youth ministry was. I'm just using it as an example to say that, look, you step out, you do something that's very different, pioneer. You expand the kingdom of God in new territories, lead from the fronts. And so we begin to do these kinds of things. We continue to do these kinds of things. And God will prompt you. When I say pioneer, it's not just the pastor pioneering. It's all of us pioneering. Maybe in your own area, in your own field, in your own place where God's given you grace and strength. You begin to step out with God and do things that have not been done before. You do it. Say, but pastor, I'm a college student. What can I do? You can do a lot as a college student for the kingdom of God. You can pioneer. I remember I was a college student, and this is going back many years. I was living in the United States, and then I remember one December, or it was November of that year, God just put into my heart, go to Albania. I didn't even know where Albania was. I had to look it up. Somewhere in Eastern Europe. So I told one of the church elders that I said, I want to go to Albania. Do you know anybody there? I said, go. I remember I was only a college student. So I bought my ticket. Went to Albania. December. Gosh, which year was it? I can't remember now. Whatever that year was. I think it was 90. Or 91, I think it was. Christmas of that year, I spent in Albania. That country, Albania, had just that year or the year before, just opened up. It was a communist country closed for 40 years. It was closed from the entire rest of the world. It's like how North Korea is currently, or mostly. Albania was totally locked from the rest of the world. Nobody else could go into that country. But just Around that time, the, the ruler there at that time was overthrown. The country had just opened up. And I didn't know all these details. But there I was, landed, landing in Albania. And, and we went in through parts of that country preaching the gospel. And it was just an amazing thing to hear, to see people hear the name of Jesus for the first time in their lives. Because everything, religion had been wiped out of that country for 40 years. They had no religion. And I was only a college student. So you as a college student, you as a young person, God can use you to do things for his kingdom. Amen? So don't hold back. Whoever you are, a young person, older person, God can use you to pioneer, to open up territories for his kingdom. 
go do it. Whether it's in the realm of business, entertainment, sport, media, art, whatever. Open up those territories for the kingdom of God. But we must consolidate in order to pioneer. We must also consolidate in order to increase. And we must consolidate in order to prepare for revival. So if we want to pioneer, what must we do? Consolidate. That means all that we've learned, consolidate it. We must also consolidate in order to increase. And I believe if, God, if God's going to take us to the next level, increase as a church, see expansion as a church, growth as a church, we need to consolidate. Some of you are, understand and recognize the vision. And, and you know, you've, you've heard us say, you know, we want to have five locations with 50,000 people each. But in order to get there and start moving in that direction, we need to consolidate. And if we need to consolidate in order to prepare for revival, meaning to see God bring a pour out of spirit and see a move of God, to see a visitation of God, we need to consolidate. So all that we've received, all that we've heard, all of the teaching on the word, on prayer, on faith, on confession, on the prophetic, on the apostolic, on the healing, the deliverance, the kingdom of God, the house of God, living the Christian life, revival, missions, we've heard so much in these 15 years. I want to challenge you. Can you consolidate that in your life? Bring it all together. Let's walk in it. Can we do it? Let's consolidate that. You know, here are some things you've probably heard us repeat over the years. Who I am in Christ is who I really am. It's just saying, look, this is your identity. You live out of who you are in Christ. When we talk about purpose, we talk about the fact that God has places he wants you to go, people he wants you to meet, lives he wants you to touch, and things he wants you to do for his kingdom. You may have heard us repeat that over the years. Every believer is a minister. Our desire is to be a people who are his dwelling place, and a people who manifest his glory in an ever-increasing. So what do you want to do? We want to be a people or his dwelling place where the presence of God abides and, and increases. And, and we want to manifest the glory in increasing measure. We are an apostolic and a prophetic church. As a prophetic people, we walk in tune with his heart, hearing from heaven. As an apostolic people, we step out and do things that have not been done. And you've heard us talking about revival. We desire to be, we desire to walk in revival, to be carriers of revival. So everywhere we go, we set people ablaze with fires of revival. But we've got to consolidate all this because you've heard all this over the years. But we've got to bring it all together and begin to walk in it. So as I conclude this section here and this message here this morning on, on, uh, on consolidating, for us as a church, here are some things I want, to, I want us to act on. I want us to make use of available resources. Make use of the resources that are available to us as a church. Do you know that every sermon that has been preached here from 2004, that's 11 years worth of sermons, is available online? Every sermon, every Sunday sermon, with sermon notes, and some cases with the PowerPoint also. Every sermon since 2004 is available to you for free. You don't even charge one dollar for it. It's available to you for the last 11 years worth of sermon is available on the church website. You go in there, click the year, click the topic, whatever, you can get it. 11 years worth of sermon. Do you know we have 45 titles, books available for you, all for free? 45. And there'll be more coming this year. But those books are available for each one of us for free. 
You can pick them out on the book table. You can go to the church website, download it. All, many topics have been covered, but it's there. The resources are there to feed your spirit. It's available for free. I want to share this testimony because it's really touched my heart. I think it was in the month of November, so just several weeks back. I was in the office. There was a young lady sitting there. She had come to meet Arthi for some work. So she saw me, hello, pastor, and she shook my hand. I said, wow. I said, I was waiting to meet you. So, oh, hi, hi, what's your name? I said, hi. First time I'm meeting her. Then she said, pastor, I've been in this church for one and a half years. But I have read all your books. That just touched my heart. This young lady, been in this church for only one and a half years. And she said, I've read all your books. That means she's made an effort. All that we've put out as a church in 15 years. She made an effort to get it. And she had moved to Bangalore from another city. She started attending here. But in one and a half years, she read all the books. She, so what's, what am I saying? See, if you want to make the effort, you can. You can consolidate all that we've put out. And you can put it into your spirit and begin to walk in it. It's available. And I know it can be done because this lady, this young lady told me, she did it. I said, I felt like saying, please pray for me, you know. <laughs> Do something, man. I never heard something like this before. But she did it. I want to challenge you. Will you make use of these resources? It's all available for us. But we need to bring it together. The other thing we're going to do this year is we're going to release a, a Journeying Together journal. It'll be out uh, in about a week's time. We've never, we haven't done this before, but we're releasing it this year. It'll, it'll be available at your church location in about a week's time. A journal. It's basically a two-year Bible reading plan. But along that journal, it's not a daily devotional, but it's only a guide. So every day of the year, there's a Bible passage to read. And if we follow that, we can all read through the Bible in two years' time. But along with that, there are prayer points. and point, One point on different areas. How to pray for yourself or your family. How to pray for an unsaved one. A, a, a prayer for the church. A prayer for our city. And also a prayer for a state in our nation. There's also a declaration of faith there. A confession of faith. Every day you make a declaration. And what we've tried to do in this journal, and the way we, in what way we've put it together, is to consolidate everything we've tried to teach and for us to learn. Whether it's in the reading of God's word, and there's also a verse to memorize. Okay, so we've tried to consolidate all of that. We want the word of God to rest in our hearts. So the same verse repeats every uh, for five days or uh, for seven days, and then you get to pick up a new verse. So if we if we all use that journal, in a year we will learn fifty two at least fifty two verses of scripture. I mean, you'd be proud, man. I know fifty two verses, but <laughs> and if you do this two year thing. You know, 104 verses of scripture in your heart. And as we keep journeying year after year, soon you'll have 300 verses of scripture in your heart. But these are things we've tried. And so we're going to make this, you know, try to get, get us to do in the past. And so this year we're going to bring it out as this journeying together prayer and Bible reading journal for each of us. But if we just follow those disciplines every day, Read that passage, passage scripture. Take a, in about 30 seconds to pray for each prayer point. Tells you what to pray for. You will know how to pray for in different situations. 
He will also make that faith declaration. There were different declarations each day on, on who we are in Christ and different declarations of the word of God. One declaration every day and a verse to memorize. It's going to help us consolidate everything we've been talking about in the last 15 years. Because we want to position ourselves for increase. Get ready for the next level. The third thing we're going to do also is to position people and ministry teams. So this year as we position, as we, as we consolidate, we want to establish, put people in the right place, put teams in the right place, so that we can begin to consolidate in those specific ministry areas as we prepare for growth. So to conclude this part here, as a church in 2016, let's consolidate so that we can prepare for increase, we can prepare for revival and we can prepare to pioneer. Are you all with me so far? This is what we're going to do as a church. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.